Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A very short call to worship, Psalm 48, verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. Oh, because the Lord is great, he is greatly to be praised. I was just asked to pray for rain. Let's just do that and then give the Lord some praise. Lord, you know the land is in need of rain. And Lord, we ask you, the all-powerful, yes, almighty yes, God, yes, to send yes, the rain. Yes. Send the rain, the natural rain and the spiritual rain. And Lord, let your presence rain down upon us this day. And we declare, great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. And we are going to now praise you. Thank you, Lord. Worship 
him. Let's worship him. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Oh, nothing is better than you. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. You are worthy in this place. Hallelujah, Lord. 
everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of
truly is done. And the Lord says that in the days to come, you will see the manifestation of that thing. And I heard the Lord say that this morning, he's placing families back together. And I heard the Lord say that this morning, he's healing those who have been wounded in the families. And he's bringing healing and healing and healing. Oh, and when there seemed to be no way, the Lord says, I make a way. I make a way. And when you don't see it, the Lord says, I make a way. <laughs> and when you don't see it, I heard the Lord say that he is still moving. He is still moving. He is still doing it. Strengthen your faith. Lift your hope up. For your hope is in him.
Hallelujah. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And many of you have been in a service where New Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church joined us for the baptism part of the service. In this past week, Pastor Powell, their pastor, passed away unexpectedly. The funeral will actually be uh, at Jubilee a week from tomorrow. But let's lift up that church family and his family uh, this morning. Father, we, our hearts are heavy, Lord, when we consider the loss of Pastor Powell. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being able to know him and minister together. Lord, we lift up his family. Oh, may they experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We lift up his church family today as they grieve. Oh, may the Holy Spirit be so present with that church family. Guide them, Lord, in where to go next. But oh, we thank you, Lord, for the hope, the blessed hope that we have of an eternity with Jesus. And we thank you that Pastor Powell is now with you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for that. Lord, we sang earlier, we want to see your glory. Oh, Lord, we need in this day and hour to see your glory. Would you manifest your glory amongst your people, oh God? And I thank you, Lord, that your word says when we see that glory, we are transformed into that same image by the Spirit of the Lord. Transform us to be more like Jesus. I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Before you're seated, would you greet a few people nearby? Just encourage one another today. Maybe there's somebody near that just needs a word of encouragement from you. Meet somebody you've never met before. I want to welcome you to Jubilee today and welcome those who are joining us online and any of you who may be here for the first time. Welcome to the Jubilee family. We'd love to get to know you better. There's a welcome card in front of you and if you would fill that out and drop it in the offering basket or Turn it in at the kiosk on your way out. We do have a gift back there for you. But know that we pray during the week over our guests, so you are going to be prayed for. The children may go ahead and be dismissed for Children's Church. And while the kids are being dismissed, we have some video announcements. And you can also kind of follow along in your bulletin. Good morning. Welcome, Jubilee. Look at this. We are so glad you could join us this Sunday morning. I'm Ruth, and as I said, this is Keisha, and we are here to bring you your Sunday morning announcements. Yes, we welcome you once, we welcome you twice, we welcome you with the love of Jesus Christ. Welcome back. Yes. So our first announcement, our parents of our kids going to kids camp. This is specifically for you. So if you did not get my email, please let me know, then I can send that to you. But otherwise, be at church tomorrow, tomorrow already at 9 a.m. sharp, 9 a.m. We don't want to leave without you. I mean, we won't. But still, please be here at 9 a.m. so we can get your kids to kids camp. It's going to be a great time. They get to spend four days with yours truly. And we're just going to have fun um, doing water games and most importantly, just hearing what God has for our kids this summer. So 
Please. Along with Gaga Ball. Gaga Ball, 9 a.m. here. Please be here so we can get your kids kids camp. Now, our junior high parents, if you're if they're going into sixth grade to going into ninth grade this fall, this is for you. If you are not registered yet and you've paid or you've talked to Pastor Buddy or myself, please get registered. That needs to happen by tomorrow. Honestly, do it today so then we're not late. Last but not least for camp, our senior teen going into 10th grade to our 2023 graduates. If you have not signed up yet, that's okay. You still have time, but don't wait. Just do it now so then we don't have late fees. If you don't know how to do that, please again, talk to me or Pastor Buddy. We'd love to get that ball rolling for you. And then you're all clear until July. So please get registered if you have not registered yet. Thank you so much. Okay, now this is for all of the parents who have kids in Kids Church with me. So we have a new check-in system um, for our, actually, nursery and Kids Church uh, children. So we need all of the parents, not just in the nursery, to take their kids to the nursery, but also every parent who has kids in Kids Church, you need to bring them physically to Kids Church. Your kids can't just come. I guess this we time, missed that we one today. To this new check-in <laughs> system that we have rolling so it'll be a few weeks but we would appreciate your patience as we get this new check-in system rolling so just to ensure your child's safety and just <clears throat> so we can get this ball rolling for our, our new check-in system so we'd really appreciate that um, if you could check in your kids physically yourselves these next few weeks um, we hey, have hey, Ruth, wait 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 I forgot to tell you I know it's just about we was just about to get ready to close up but before we go we just came by and let you know we still need volunteers yes we do right so I just don't remember those dates exactly I think it was like Juneteenth is yes June 16th from three to nine that's right that's right we need you to mm -hmm. come out help us at the Juneteenth at Lake George mm -hmm. please be there early if you need additional information please contact Pastor Buddy he will fill you in or either just come out and have fun with us yeah also on June 28th we have so many things going on June 28th we have our first kids event of the summer it's our art night we'll be outside from 6 to 7 30 for for the kids um please sign up there is a sign up on the, at the kiosk and also for all of our summer events for the kids there's this handy dandy flyer that's also on the kiosk that you can take so then you know about all of our kids events for the summer so just remember we didn't get a chance to cover everything for the month of june so please 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 make sure you read your bulletin get one from the urchins when you come in but make sure that you keep up with everything because we'd yes. love to see your wonderful face at every event. So many things going on and we're so excited about all of them. So thank you so much for joining us. And as always, oh, Jesus! <laughs> all right, Becky, why don't you come and uh, let us know about your class starting Wednesday. And then Pastor Buddy's got a couple things to share as well. We are going to begin a four week class on You Can Prophesy. How many of you have ever prophesied or given someone a word? That is awesome. Do you know that God wants all of us to be able to prophesy and to share with others? And so this is going to be a fun class, and it's going to be an activating class. Don't be scared. Just come. We're going to have a lot of fun. Okay, so it's um, starting this Wednesday from 7 to 8. All right, Pastor Buddy. And there's prayer from 6 to 7, and then the class from 7 to 8, starting Wednesday. Praise the Lord, saints. Y'all better take a picture right now because you won't ever see this again. I just want y'all to know that. You won't ever see this again. Today, I am wearing a Chicago Bears hat in honor. Go ahead. Get it out. Come on. Get it. Y'all go ahead because I promise you. No, no, no. <laughs> my, 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 my brother, Pastor Powell, was a, a avid Chicago Bears fan. 
And even though I told him and my wife, I will never wear Chicago Bears anything. God told me, woke me up this morning. And he said, honor, honor your brother. Go ahead. Just go ahead and wear the hat. It's, it's only one day. So it's not football season, so we all right. Um, just real quick, I just got a couple of announcements. A, for the parents, I know it was kind of said late, but uh, for the next couple of weeks, we really need you to take your kids back. Um, we need to make sure we got updated information. We, we got a new security system that we put in place, and we just want to make sure all is well. Once you come back the first time and you get us and we get this information, I promise you it's going to be super easy and you won't need us moving forward, right? We'll, you, you'll get a whole sticker. You'll have everything on your phone, what you need. So please just be patient with us for the next couple of weeks. If you have kids in the nursery or in children's church, please physically walk them back. Please, you or a older sibling. Amen? Amen. Now, I got a new class on Thursday called Why Do I Believe? Amen. Do y'all know why y'all believe? Do you know why you a Christian or you just do it because you was told to go to church every Sunday morning? So we're going to talk about it, be about it. It's in the youth, in the youth room every Thursday night, 6 o'clock right here or on Zoom. Please come see me. Utilize the bulletin or whatever needs to work for you, for you. Lastly, on Juneteenth is this coming Friday. For those that are participating, we are going to meet um, at the park. Not here. We're going to meet at the park at the time that you arrive. You will be getting an email from me this week kind of talking about some of the details. For those that are part of the parade and you're helping with the float, the, the trailer is over Pastor Mark and Pastor Becky's house, so we'll be going over there to decorate it. So again, you'll be getting an email from me. And those on the community outreach team, you'll be getting an email from me. Amen? I got a lot of emails to send today. God bless y'all. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Just check out the other <clears throat> announcements. And I will just mention that we're doing a water baptism the last Sunday of this month. So if you want to be baptized in water or one of your family members, let us know. Uh, at this time, I'm going to um, ask Blama and Manigo to come. We're going to dedicate Elias to the Lord and any family members or friends who are joining you, feel free to come on up. And uh, we are excited about being able to baptize or uh, dedicate Elias today. And you know, in 1 Samuel 1, <clears throat> Hannah prayed that God would give her, uh, her and her husband, a child, and she prayed, God, if you give us a child, we will dedicate that child to you. And uh, a year later, uh, Samuel was born. And so when Samuel was very young, they brought him into the house of the Lord and dedicated him to God. And then in Luke 2, we see Joseph and Mary doing the same thing. They brought Jesus uh, into the house of the Lord when he was just a baby and uh, dedicated him to God. And so we follow that at Jubilee, and we encourage parents when their children are shortly after they're born to bring them into the house of the Lord and to dedicate them to God. And so as, as you dedicate uh, Elias to the Lord, you're signifying a few important things. First of all, your own faith in Christ as Savior and Lord of your lives. Secondly, your thanksgiving to God for this precious, precious gift that he has added uh, to your home. Uh, you are also committing to raising him in the ways of God uh, and to whatever purpose God has for his life. And we believe God does have a wonderful purpose for his life. So in light of that, I want to charge you uh, before your church family and before the Lord that you uh, raise up Elias in the ways of God and that you'll seek to... Uh, share with him, Jesus, as he gets older and begins to understand and lead him into a personal relationship with Christ, and that you will uh, seek for your lives to be a wonderful example for him. So if you will accept these charges, please together answer, we will. We will. All right, I am going to anoint Elias with oil as we dedicate him to the Lord, oil being a symbol of the Holy Spirit.
In the name of Jesus, I anoint Elias Prince Kamara and dedicate him to God in the name of the Father and of his Son Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this precious gift of life. We dedicate him to you today, knowing, God, that you have a wonderful plan for him. We pray a covering over his precious life, that he will be safe. And, Lord, I pray that as he grows, he will have a heart sensitive to the things of God and that at a very young age he will turn to you and serve you all the days of his life. Lord, whatever plans and purposes you have for him, we call them uh, into being in your timing in the name of Jesus. And Heavenly Father, I pray for Manigo. Lord, I thank you that you chose her to be Elias's mom and that she is a woman after your own heart, Lord, that she loves you. And I pray, Lord, that every day you will give her everything she needs to be the mom for this beautiful baby boy. Lord, I pray that when she feels like she doesn't know what to do, that your Holy Spirit will guide her, that you will show her. I thank you, Lord, that you are imparting into her the wisdom that she needs to train this precious baby boy. And we bless her in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, I lift up Blama. I thank you for him, Lord. And uh, I thank you for his commitment to you, to family. And Lord, just give him ongoing wisdom every day, Lord, the wisdom he needs to uh, lead his home and to uh, live as you'd have him to live. And I thank you, God, that you are going to give him uh, wisdom even beyond, Lord, that he would expect. And just, uh, Lord, in amazing ways, you're going to help him as he continues to lead his home. Lord, let this home just be filled with your peace, your presence. And uh, we just thank you, God, for this day and for what it means in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I would like to be able to hold this guy. And I'm waking him up. I'm waking him up from his nap. <laughs> and on behalf of your church family, I want to give you this certificate and these flowers. And the uh, red carnation is for you, Blama, representing your, the courage, the strength, the fatherhood. The white carnation for you, which represents the purity and sanctity of motherhood. And then for Elias, the rose, which is going to be opening up in the next couple of days and sending a sweet fragrance into your home, representing his life that will unfold and bring a sweet fragrance upon the earth. So we congratulate you as your church family. I'm going to ask the ushers to come, and as we get ready to worship with our offering, I'm going to just read something I wrote uh, some time ago. Jesus said more about money than he did just about any other subject. And here's what he said in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot have devoided loyalties. We were created to function better with a single loyalty. The Greek word for mammon can be translated as wealth. It's not wrong to have wealth, but it's wrong for wealth to have us. It's not wrong to have wealth, but it's wrong to serve wealth. Our wealth should serve us rather than us serving wealth. If God is truly our master, then our money should be submitted to God. This should certainly be reflected in our giving. So as we receive the offering this morning, you are being given the opportunity through your giving to serve God rather than money. So I want to thank you for your ongoing continued support. All right, well, we're going to jump right into the scriptures today. And we've been in a series of messages on the theme, understanding the five functional gifts of the church from Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And last Sunday, we did a fairly deep dive into this subject. So if you were not here, or you could just use a refresher 
uh, I would encourage you to go on to either our website, which will direct you either to our YouTube, Rumble, or Facebook channels, or go directly to those channels, and you can watch it. Because I'm not going to spend uh, really any time specifically to review any of this today, but we're actually going to transition to sort of another series or a series within a series. And so today we're going to begin looking at the subject of understanding the manifestation gifts. Now, we ended last week by going through a handout, three categories of spiritual gifts, and I'd like you to uh, take that out. If you did not get one of these, uh, I know the ushers are collecting the offering, but um, if you did not get one of these, maybe you can hold your hands up and one of the ushers can get that to you. Um, the notes on the back of your bulletin, you can ignore those, all right? We're not going to get to that today. So uh, yesterday, I just kind of felt some direction to kind of focus on a specific part of this message. So if you look at that handout, we have been looking at this topic of the five functional gifts from Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and we see that those gifts were given to the church to equip all of us really for ministry, to equip all of us to use the gifts God's given us to serve and minister uh, to others, both in the church context and to the community at large. We also saw that these gifts are reflected even in the marketplace with people in different uh, occupations, even with both believers and unbelievers. And then um, the second category of gifts are the seven motivational gifts from Romans 12, 4 through 8. These gifts have to do with how we are individually motivated. We could call this really our personality types. Now, in this series, I'm not really getting into that category of gifts with any depth because it's really not the focus, but I do want to help you to see that as we focus on the topic of spiritual gifts, I want you to see uh, where they fit in the broader context of gifts. And we've done classes on these before, and we'll likely do it again. But just a quick review, we have the kinetic, three, three categories of these gifts. There's the kinetic gifts, and these are action-oriented gifts. People given with, with this kind of personality type, they act first, and then after they act, they think or feel. There's prophecy and ministry. And then the second category of gifts are cognitive gifts. These are thinking-oriented gifts. And if you're wired this way, you kind of think things through and then act and then feel. And there's the gift of teaching, leading, giving. And then there's the emotive gifts. And these are feeling gifts. These are gifts where people they feel first and then act out of that, so the feeling tends to lead the way. These are exhorting and then caring or showing mercy. Now, in these first two categories of gifts, God has given you an orientation towards one of the gifts in each of these two categories. So, in the five functional gifts, you are wired to either be oriented more toward apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral teaching. One of those is how you're kind of wired, and then they will be in a descending order. So you, we could say it this way, you have a five-functional gift profile, every one of you. And then when we look at the seven manifestation gifts, it's very similar in that you are wired with one of these personality types as your primary orientation, then you will have a secondary, and again, in descending order. So you also have a seven motivational gift profile. Now, we're going to jump actually to the bottom of your handout there, and I want to look at some additional gifts these are gifts mentioned in different places in Scripture that really don't necessarily fit into one of the other gift categories. And that means, in addition to the gifts we just mentioned, you may have one or more of these gifts. And I'm just going to go through these really quickly. There's the gift of craftsmanship, sometimes referred to as an artisan. These are people who are good. They're gifted at making and fixing things. 
not my gift. Making and fixing things. And often people are gifted in a very particular area. It might be, like in, especially in the Old Testament, it might be fabrics. It might be precious stones. So it could be a lot of different areas. And then there's helps, which is serving in practical areas. There's administration, which involves planning, organizing, overseeing those plans. There's hospitality, which is to be gifted in serving food and can include uh, entertaining people and even providing lodging. There's bishops and overseers. And by the way, those two words come from the same uh, Greek word, and they basically provide leadership uh, and oversight in the local church or a group of churches. And one I did not include on the handout last week, but it is on the handout this week, is Elders and Deacons. Uh, the books of Timothy and Titus talk about the qualifications for those ministries and so forth. We have elders uh, mentioned quite a bit in Acts and other places. Basically, elders provide oversight to the local church, and deacons serve in practical areas in the local church. So with that as our kind of backdrop, we're going to now go into the uh, third category of spiritual gifts, the nine manifestation gifts, which are supernatural gifts given by the Holy Spirit. And this category is different from the other categories in that you don't have a manifestation gift profile. These gifts are given by the Holy Spirit, and because the Holy Spirit is in you, if you're a follower of Jesus, potentially any one of these gifts could flow through you in any given situation. Now, it could be that one of these gifts is a predominant gift that you have, that you're comfortable in moving in, and that you move in it often, but it could also be that at a given, in a given situation, God may flow one of these gifts through you that you've never used before. And it may be very infrequent that it happens again. So you do not have, in that same sense, a descending uh, order. Now, as we get ready to jump into this subject, I, I just really felt uh, in a strong way to say this to you, that there are some of you here who may be thinking, well, these gifts aren't for me. I mean, I'm just not very spiritual. I don't even know what I think about this stuff. I don't know if I understand it. Uh, man, you know, I don't know the Bible very well, and I still have some personal struggles, so this is probably for everybody else but not me. But I want to challenge that thinking today because God wants these gifts to flow through every one of you. Now, some of you may be thinking, but I'm too afraid to come up and speak in a microphone in a church service. Well, what I want to really encourage you in is these gifts actually should be flowing more outside the church building than inside the church building. Now, we believe and we encourage the gifts to be used in corporate worship, but here's the thing, if you stop and think about it, in a given Sunday morning, how many people, how many people compared to the, the whole attendance can, can there be that manifests these spiritual gifts? Well, maybe you have a message in tongues and interpretation. Maybe you've got a prophecy or two, and, and then, you know, then we move on because the, the service is not all about the gifts. There's other aspects. There's worship. There's the preaching. There's dedications and offerings and baptisms and you know, all the other things we do as a church family, and so the gifts are one important part of that. So what I'm saying is this, in any given service, only a small percentage of the whole are going to be used on any given Sunday morning. But how many could potentially be used outside these walls throughout the week? Everybody. Everybody. It would be possible for every person here between now and next Sunday to have used one or more of these gifts out there. So what I want you to think about with these gifts is, yes, they fit in a Sunday morning worship service, but I want you to think about they are gifts for you to use out there. Now, you might use them in a ministry setting, in a small group. You might use them in ministering one-on-one. -on -one. And these gifts can be used very effectively, actually, with lost people. In fact, I want you to think of these gifts as power tools in your spiritual toolbox 
to help you get the job of ministering to others done more efficiently. Now, I know we have some carpenters here, uh, and some of you may have started, you know, carpentry back in the day when there weren't a lot of power tools. You know, you can get the job done with just a hammer, but a power hammer, you can really get the job done, right? Nobody's ever trusted me to use one of those. I've never used it. You can, get, you can get the job done with a handsaw, but, oh, it's nothing like a power saw, right? And, and so if you think about it, we can get ministry done, you know, without the supernatural, but, boy, it, it takes a long time, and sometimes you just get stuck. These are power tools that break through barriers, break through resistances, and allow you to get the job done of touching the lives of others far more effectively. I can't count the number of times I have seen somebody, for example, get a prophetic word, and it just breaks through all the barriers, all the, strong, all the things that, you know, were holding them back, and they're just thrust forward uh, into ministry. So uh, I'd like you to think of, of that as we go along. Let's uh, read this list. This is 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 8. It says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And let me just pause there. Notice these gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. You don't choose these gifts. I think I'll take this one. They're not natural gifts. You weren't born with, you know, one of these gifts, and nobody else gives you the gift. Now, God can impart gifts through the laying on of hands, but even then, it's still subject ultimately to what the Holy Spirit decides, and we'll be talking about that more in coming weeks. And let me just give you a homework assignment. Actually, next week is Father's Day. Becky's going to be bringing a word, and I know she's got a lot on her heart for that, so that'll be a powerful service next Wednesday or Sunday. So wherever I stop today, um, we'll pick it up in two weeks. So here's your homework for, for two weeks from today. Starting uh, this week then, read 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. That's your homework. Read 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 a few times through. Remember, the more you put into something, the more you'll get out of it. So I'd encourage you to read through that a few times. But let's keep going, verse 10, to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now, what we'll eventually do, probably in the next message in this series, is we're going to go back to chapter 12, verse 1, and we're just going to go through those three chapters so that we can read about the gifts in the context uh, in which they were written. And as we do, we will then be able to see uh, a lot more about these gifts that I won't be getting into today. But what I felt at yesterday as I was going over my notes, I just really felt like I should slow down and give you a definition of each of these gifts give you a biblical example or two of each of these gifts, and then the direction I felt that I wasn't planning on is to share some personal examples of these gifts, and that really got me to do a lot of uh, thinking about these gifts and past experiences, so I want to share some of that with you. So we could divide these manifestation gifts also into three groups. The first group we could call revelation gifts. Revelation gifts, these are gifts that reveal something. There's three revelation gifts, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. I'm going to define the word of wisdom, we'll start there, as a portion of God's wisdom to bring a divine solution to a specific situation. This is not God imparting his wisdom to you to where you have his wisdom 24-7. This is when we're going through life and for a specific situation. Typically, it's a problem we're having or somebody else is having, and we don't know what to do. And at that moment, God downloads that portion of his wisdom that will be the solution to that situation. And then we get to go back being as dumb as we usually are after that situation. Um, 
So I'm just wanting you to realize it's not God giving you his wisdom and now you have it 24-7. It's him giving you a portion of it that's needed for that situation. And we have really a, a pretty interesting example of this in 1 Kings chapter 3. Uh, there, there was um, a king by the name of Solomon. And um, there were two harlots who actually lived in the same home, and they each had a baby about the same time. And one of the mothers accidentally at night rolled over on her baby, and the baby died. She wakes up, sees her baby is dead, and she gets up, and she takes her dead baby and goes to the other mother and changes babies. The other mother wakes up, realizes her baby is dead, and then the mother realizes, wait a minute, this isn't my baby. We got a problem here. <laughs> so these two mothers go to Solomon, the king, and they're both arguing that the live baby is their baby and the dead baby is the other mother's baby. How would you like to be Solomon in that situation? Before the days of DNA testing, you know, where they could have figured it out scientifically. So... Um, that, that situation could kind of use like a word, of not, a, word of, a word of wisdom, right? So Solomon gets this word of wisdom, and he, he says this. He says, bring me a sword. So whoever was there brings Solomon a sword. And Solomon says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Cut the baby in half and give each mother half of the living baby. The mother of the living baby said, no, no, don't do that. Give, the, give her the baby. And the mother whose baby has died said, no, you don't have to. That's okay. Go ahead and divide the baby. Guess what Solomon figured out right there? Who was the real mama? So Solomon said, give the living baby to that, that mama because we know she's the real mama. And everybody was amazed by the wisdom that he had in that situation. I'll give you two examples personally where I think I had the word of wisdom flow in me. And by the way, I don't consider myself a super, like, spiritual person when it comes to all these uh, manifestation gifts. But when um, Jubilee was buying this land, and there was so many miracles that are behind the story that I just don't have time to get into, but we were in <clears throat> the building off Quarry Road. How many of you, you were at Jubilee at that time when we were in the quarry building? Wow. All right. So here's the situation. We were in that building, and we were going to buy this land, and the land was 53 acres, a lot of land for the size church we were, and the owner would only sell it all or nothing, and he didn't even have the land for sale that goes into the miracles of, of how we got it and the time that transpired and how he came down in the price and we got a great price, all these things. But at any rate, um, I'm like well, thinking, okay, how are we going to do this? Because uh, we don't have like a bunch of money to buy the land. Uh, we don't have much equity to buy the land. And we're not a part of a denomination who will co-sign for us. So uh, we didn't know, will our local bank, you know, loan us the money. So you know, what are we, what are we going to do? So I just felt like God gave me a word. And the word was, go to the guy selling it. And he was, he was doing this on behalf of his siblings. It was their inheritance. So it wasn't just him deciding. It was he and his brothers and sisters. And I felt the Lord say, offer him 25% cash and ask him to finance it, you know, contract for deed that you'll give him 25% down, which we didn't have. <laughs> and then every year, give him 25% for the next three years till it's paid off. So that was the word I got. And it wasn't like me figuring it out, like strategizing, or I know how finance works. It was just, that's the word I got. So I went and presented it to him, and he's like, eh, that sounds good. I'll just approve it with my brothers and sisters. And that's exactly what happened. And... I think we got the land paid off like in two and a half years. It was, you know, a lot sooner than, than that. And then God helped us raise the money quickly to give him the 25% down. And then a uh, second word of wisdom uh, having to do with this transition also. So we had that building, 
and we were going to build this building. And we needed to sell that building to be able to build this building. But there's a problem if we sell that building to get the money to build, to, to be the down money for this, then where are we going to meet? And if we don't sell that building, well, we couldn't even start building this building, but, you know, the last thing we wanted was owning two buildings, you know, payments. So, again, I, what do we do? And, and again, I just felt a divine download saying, go to this particular realtor and tell him this. Tell him that you want to sell the building, but that you don't want to leave the building after you sell it. You want to lease it back from who buys it. And of course, in the natural, it's like, what are the chances of that? You know, who wants to buy a building and then lease it back? So I went to this particular realtor, explained what we wanted to do, and his response was like, well, that's really interesting because I have a, a business. It's a guy who he wants to start a daycare and also use a building for a center for, I think it was autistic children or something like that. And... And he wants to find a building that he can buy and secure, but he doesn't want to use it right away because he needs time to get all his business in order and to get all the permits and to get his staff hired and everything like that. <laughs> there never was a for sale sign on that building. That's exactly what happened. We sold the building. Um, and then we leased it back because I was thinking the worst, the last thing I wanted to do is go find a temporary place, you know, between. So um, anyway, that's what happened, and God worked that out, and I was so grateful for that. Uh, a second gift is the word of knowledge, a portion of God's knowledge regarding the past or present to bring affirmation, confirmation, or to facilitate ministry. This is similar in that it doesn't mean you're smart or well-educated and you've got all kinds of knowledge, and it doesn't mean God suddenly imparted to you his knowledge 24-7, but it means that God downloads for a specific need, a specific situation. He gives you just that portion of knowledge that he has that you use in that situation, and it's knowledge you would otherwise not have known anything about. And usually the biggest benefit to sharing a word of knowledge is the person you're sharing it with, they know that. They know what it is, but they know you didn't know apart from God. And so imagine how beneficial that can be. And by the way, back to the word of wisdom, imagine how beneficial that could be if somebody shares with you a need and they say, I have no clue what to do, and God downloads to you the solution. Especially imagine if that person doesn't even know the Lord, and now they have a divine solution. Same with word of knowledge. If, if they know that, wait a minute, you didn't, how could you have known that? And you're like, well, the Holy Spirit just showed me. Again, that can help them to believe, well, wow, God really knows. God really cares. God is real. And how much more are they likely to open up to whatever else you're going to share if you just shared some of the secrets of their heart that they know you didn't know? And I'll give you an example or two in Scripture, and there's really so many of them in Scripture, but the one I'll mention is from Acts 10. I find this one very interesting, and, and there's so many different dynamics to it. There's a guy by the name of Cornelius, and he's an interesting guy because he prays, but he's not saved yet. He, like, gives to the poor, but he's not saved yet. He's religious, but not, but not saved. So here this guy is, not saved, but prays, believes in God, but doesn't know anything about Jesus or anything. And he's praying, and God gives him this download. And I want you to think about how specific this download is. Sometimes we read stuff in the Bible, and it's just like, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's the Bible. But think about it. So here's the information he gets. He gets this information. There's a man named Simon, whose surname is Peter. So he's given a name. He's, he doesn't know this guy yet. And he's in Joppa. Now he gets the city the guy's in. He's lodging with Simon a tanner. Okay, now whose house he's at. Whose house is by the sea. He gets the address. He will tell you what you must do. And I want you to think about that. He's not a Christian. And he gets a name and the guy's nickname. The address he's staying at. Now that's a lot of information. For a non-Christian to get from God. 
But it's funny because it's like, this guy that I just told you about, he's going to tell you what you must do to know me and be saved. Like, how crazy is that? So he sends three men to that address. Now, again, just the timing of all this, Peter at the time just happens to be praying, right? Just happens to be praying. And while he's praying, he gets this strange vision. I won't get into the details. He's confused. He really doesn't get what this vision is all about. He's trying to process it. While he's processing it, he gets a word of knowledge saying, three men are looking for you and they're here. And then he's told, go with them. I have sent them. And so uh, that's really exactly what happens. So he really doesn't know what's going on other than he's to go with these three men. And it's kind of a funny story, actually, because Peter gets there, and he's like, why did you send for me? And Cornelius is like, I don't know, you tell me. God told me you would have something for me that I needed to hear. So what, what is he saying? And, of course, then Peter starts to get it, and his vision starts to make sense. And he preaches the gospel, and what is so incredible is these were the first Gentiles to be saved. Before that, everybody thought only Jews can be saved. So Peter had to go through this whole experience to finally figure out, oh, I guess Gentiles can be saved. Word of knowledge. I, I don't know for sure how many times this gift has flowed through me. And one of the things I want to mention is often two or three gifts will flow together. And you may be identifying it as, oh, that was a prophecy. And maybe it is, but maybe the prophecy included a word of knowledge. Maybe the prophecy included a word of wisdom. So often two or three gifts will flow together, and we don't even realize the distinction. And, and you've probably been a part of it often uh, if we've done a healing service. I'll pray that, that I get words of, uh, words of knowledge as to conditions that are present. And, and you've, you've seen that probably on a Sunday morning here before as well. And um, so I'll call that out, and then people who have that will come and we'll, we'll pray over them. So there's been various words of knowledge along those lines. And, I, and as I was thinking about that, one, this is a real old example, uh, but, but one example I, I, I remembered about that had an impact on me is we were doing a healing service in a previous church, and I believe it was a Sunday night service, and so we're, you know, preach on healing, worship, and then we're going to pray for the sick. And I get this impression that there's somebody here that has warts. And they're kind of embarrassed about it, and they'd really like for God to heal the warts. And I'm like, okay. Um, so I mentioned that, and this teenage girl kind of gasps. And I found out that she had made this deal with God that God, I'd really like these warts to go, but that's kind of an embarrassing thing to bring up. So if you want to heal my warts, have somebody say something about warts. So um, we prayed for her, and they left her shortly after that. So uh, words of knowledge. Discerning of spirits is next. A supernatural ability to identify what spirit is present, good or bad, for the purpose of protection and or facilitating deliverance. A lot of times when we think of discerning of spirits, our first thought is discerning of bad or evil spirits, and that probably is the most predominant use. But discerning of spirits could also be discerning a good spirit. Now, this can be very specific where... Perhaps there's a, a, a demonic evil spirit blocking a situation and you get the exact thing that it is because typically the more specific you are, the more authority or more faith you have against that specific thing. But other times it's more like in your spirit, kind of like a green light or a red light. So maybe you're thinking of entering into some situation with a person, a company, a business, or you know whatever it might be, and maybe, maybe you get this red light in your spirit, like something's not right here. Maybe that's all you get, but that's enough to say, okay, I'm backing off, I'm not going there. Maybe that's all you need. Sometimes it's like yellow, okay, I got to move with caution here, something, but I'm not sure. Other times, it's a green light, and maybe that's all you get. Okay, this is a go, we're good. Um, so it, it can be general, uh, again, to protect you from getting in something you shouldn't get into or to confirm, yes, this is, this is a good situation. Um, 
but in a ministry setting, again, it can help facilitate deliverance or, or ministry uh, when, again, God shows you what exactly it is you're up against so you can deal with it uh, accordingly. And I'll give you one example in Scripture, Acts 16, 16 through 18. Um, Paul and his group, they're ministering, you know, outside or wherever, and it says that this girl followed Paul, is, this is how he writes it, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. She kept saying that over and over and over and over again. Now here was the challenge of that situation. That word was true. Yes, they were servants of the Most High God. Yes, they were showing them the way of salvation. We don't really know how did she say it. Like, what was the tone? Because, again, it was, it, was, it was accurate, but maybe it came across in a mocking way or in a destructive way. We don't know. But at one point, it, it hit Paul, wait a minute, this woman has a spirit of divination. And once that was revealed to him, he went after that. He commanded the spirit to go, and the spirit left her. So he had a discerning of spirits in an unusual situation because the content of the message was right, but what was behind the message was wrong. I had, I don't know, I was probably 20 or a little older than 20 when we had a strange experience. Becky and I were youth pastors at a church, and the church had a guest speaker in for a series of meetings. And this guy was like a mega faster. I mean, he would like fast for 40 days and then do a series of meetings or whatever. And so a lot, of, a lot of things happened in his meetings. And one of the things that happened is demons started manifesting, which was something I hadn't seen a whole lot of before. And his approach when a demon would start manifesting in the service would be to command the demon to identify itself. And then when the demon identified itself, he would command it by name to come out, and the demon would come out. And uh, so one of the evenings, uh, this woman started manifesting demons, and he started ministering to her. And I was standing there kind of helping with the ministry he was leading, but I was just kind of there praying and everything. And he, he did this through several demons that each left, but she was still manifesting. And when he commanded the next demon to, to reveal its name, nothing happened. It wouldn't. And so I'm like sitting there, and all of a sudden the name of a demon pops into my head. I give him the name. He calls it by the name I gave it, and the demon comes out. And that happens for like, I don't know, the next three or four demons until the woman was, was free. So uh, kind of a strange experience, um, but I believe that was the gift of discerning of spirits at work. So let's go into the second category of spiritual gifts. These are power gifts these are gifts that do something. So the first category, revelation gifts, gifts that reveal something. These are power gifts, gifts that do something. The first one mentioned here is faith. This is a supernatural ability. By the way, I'm going to back up because uh, I think this is important. Back to discerning of spirits. It's not a gift of criticism or fault finding. Some people are really good at pointing out other people's faults, and then they think that's discerning of spirits. No, that's not. So uh, just because you are able to see all the mistakes in other people's lives and call them out, that's not a spiritual gift. So just wanted to make that clear. All right, so back to faith. A supernatural ability to believe God for something beyond the level of the individual's faith, natural faith. So... The Bible says God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we all have faith from God. And our job is to grow the faith, right? To increase it. But here's the thing we've all experienced. There's times you face a situation and it's beyond where your current faith is at. So what the gift of faith is, is when God imparts faith for that situation that is at a level beyond where your faith was currently at. And um, I, I don't really know whether or not this gift has worked through me before. I mean, there's times I've believed God for stuff and it's, and it's happened, but I don't know, was that where my faith was at? Did God just honor taking a step of faith? Was it a gift of faith? So I, I really can't say for sure to what degree this gift may or may not have flowed through me. Uh, 
one of the things about this gift that I think is important to just make a note of is that often this faith receives a miracle rather than performs a miracle. Because one of the other gifts is the working of miracles. So this gift doesn't so much work a miracle, it often just receives a miracle. And we'll give you a couple examples in Scripture. Uh, Daniel 3, verses 16 through 13. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember those guys? And they were commanded to bow to the image, and they said, we're not going to bow. And the guy said, well, if you don't bow, you'll burn. And here's what they said. They said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's where most people's natural faith is at. Oh, throw me into a fiery furnace. No problem. Yeah, I'm sure I'll be fine. (laughs) No, I, I think God just at that point gave them the faith to believe that even though the furnace was heated seven times and the people who heated it up, they, they keeled over dead because of the heat. I think this is a supernatural gift of faith God gave them. And notice they didn't do anything except receive the miracle. They were thrown into the uh, fiery furnace. They were tied and everything. They landed, you know, on the ground. Uh, but they got up, and the only thing that burned was the ropes that had tied them. So their faith enabled them to receive a miracle of protection, and, of course, the king was amazed, and it impacted him. He made a law. Anyone who, anyone who speaks against their God, we're going to, you know, destroy, burn their home and all this stuff. So it really had a huge impact uh, upon the king, and he did a 180 in a way that never would have happened apart from something supernatural. And another story you're probably even more familiar with. Remember Daniel in the lion's den? Same kind of a deal, Daniel 6. And uh, Daniel is told that if he prays to his God in the next 30 days, he's going to get thrown into a den of lions. He still prays. He gets thrown into the den of lions. Now, notice again, he didn't work a miracle. He didn't, like with his bare hands, kill the lion. And I don't think that's normal faith. Oh, sure, throw me into a den of hungry lions. I'm sure I'll be fine. I've got lots of faith. I I think it was a supernatural gift that came on him at that moment to believe that, hey, God will... And again, he didn't do anything except trust God. And in fact, the Scripture says that because he believed in his God. So there's uh, examples of the gift of faith. And then the gifts of healing. And I want to point out that both of those words are plural. It's not gift of healing. It's gifts, plural, of healings, plural. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I'll define gifts of healing as a supernatural ability to... a supernatural ability to minister physical, emotional, or spiritual healing to the sick. So gifts of healing, uh, it, it can be not only physical, most of the healings in the Bible you know, are physical, but it can also be healing of emotional things in other areas. And I think the reason gifts of healings is both plural is because there's so much variety here. I've seen ministries that they had a gift of healing for one particular disease. Now, maybe they prayed one time for somebody who had whatever, and God did it, and their faith just like arose, and like, give me that one. I got that one. Something else maybe they haven't had any success in. And, and again, God wants to use so many people and not give everybody, you know, every gift and, and so that they're not, they don't need anybody else. So sometimes, again, people will have a gift for a particular type of sickness or disease and maybe not another, and yet somebody else has the gift for that particular one. Uh, we're not going to get into it much, but as you know, Jesus obviously moved in this gift uh, in Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And there's many examples throughout the Gospels where he healed everybody. In fact, you'll never find a place where somebody came to Jesus for healing and he turned them away. If you think about it, most of the people Jesus healed were actually not what we'd call Christians. He hadn't died yet for their sins. And something, uh, I'll give you a couple of biblical examples. Uh, Acts 5, 15, and 16, uh, Peter's shadow. I don't know if that's the right, yeah, I think that's the right text. Anyway, they lined up a bunch of sick people in the streets, demon-possessed people, and there was a gift of healing that came on him to where he walked by, and as soon as his shadow hit them, they were healed or delivered from demon spirits. 
And then there's another one with, uh, yeah, that, that is incredible. There's another one with Paul, Acts 19, where handkerchiefs that touched his body, they took and, and they would go and lay them on sick people or people that had uh, demonic attacks, and they were delivered. So there are situations like that. I want to just clarify something about healing, and we'll, we'll finish pretty quickly here. You can minister to the sick without having gifts of healings. The Bible gives us a general um, command to pray for the sick. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith will raise them up. So you can minister healing without having gifts of healing. But when we minister healing apart from the gifts of healing, there's other dynamics that can enter in. Your faith, their faith. Is that person walking with God? Are they good stewards of their health or, you know, whatever it might be? Are there demonic uh, interferences? So when you pray for the sick without gifts of healing, there are other things that, you know, maybe, maybe they have unforgiveness and that's blocking their healing. There can be all different things and you may have to, you know, go there. But I believe when gifts of healings are in manifestation, everybody's healed and all those other variables are bypassed. I mean, i got to believe some of the people Jesus ministered to had some issues also. But when gifts of healing are in manifestation, while the gift is manifest, people are healed, and any of those other kinds of barriers seem to be bypassed. We have seen, of course, a lot of people healed over the years. I don't know that gifts of healings, any, any of that gift has ever worked through me or not. Uh, and often when we pray for people, you know, the whole body is in agreement or maybe somebody else you're praying with. Um, so when a healing happens, I don't know, was that a gift of healing or was that just, you know, God being gracious and, and healing because Jesus died for people to be healed? Um, I'll just mention one uh, he healing that always uh, really had an impact on me because of how dramatic it was, and this was, again, in a church many years ago, and there was a family in our church, and they had a, a young girl who would have, like, seizures constantly. I mean, like, dozens and dozens every day, and there was, there was no solution they could find. No matter what they did, she would keep going in and out of these seizures, and so our church, we decided, okay, we're going to go after this, and we, we prayed for her. And um, again, I don't know that any gift of healing flowed through me. And it wasn't just me praying. It was the whole church praying. And that, that, that was the last seizure she ever had. And today, I don't know, she's probably in her 40s as a mom with, you know, a bunch of kids and never had a seizure since. Then the uh, sixth gift, working of miracles. This pretty uh, clear with the... Uh, that gift would be a supernatural um, ability to minister, or pardon me, okay, a supernatural ability to cause something to happen which bypasses or supersedes natural laws. And so think about it, something, a miracle means it bypassed the norm, the, the natural laws. I don't know that this gift has ever flowed through me. I, I can't recall a situation uh, like that. But we have uh, Jesus turning the water into wine, Jesus walking uh, on the water, and of course there's many uh, examples in Scripture. Philip, Acts uh, 8, 5, and 6 did miracles uh, before the people. So we'll, we'll finish quickly here. Then there's the utterance gifts. These are gifts that say something. And there's three prophecy, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. I got stuck there if you can help me with the next one. So prophecy is speaking forth a divinely inspired message of edification, exhortation, and comfort. Prophecy can speak to the past, present, and or future. Some people hear the word prophecy and they automatically thinking predict the future. Uh, and it can, but often prophecy is simply encouragement, edification, exhortation, and comfort. And I want to give you just one example from Paul in Acts 27. And why I think this example is so interesting is because he's on a ship with 276 men, most of them not saved. So we're not talking about a church service here. Plus, he's actually, uh, you know, kind of being arrested here. So it's an interesting context. But as they're, as they're on this ship, the storm comes up. And he says this, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. So the first kind of uh, prophecy he gives 
is uh, this is not going to end well. This, this, this ship is going to experience damage. Some time goes by, and then he, he like, presses into a, 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 another word that takes it a, a little deeper, verse 22. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. So now he gets additional prophetic word that this ship's going down, but all of you are going to be saved. Now, that'd be kind of encouraging if you were one of those people on the ship. And then a while later, verse 34, Therefore I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. So keep in mind, these are words to unsaved men, and how encouraging that would have been. Um, prophecy is the most predominant gift of all of these. And I've, we've got a lot of stories about this that I just will have to wait for another uh, message. But I want to give you the most recent example because uh, it was this morning, uh, 7, 17 a.m., all right? So there's a pastor friend I have who used to pastor in St. Cloud, and I don't know, a couple years ago, whatever, he got transferred to another state. And... Um, Keep in mind that, that he's not like a charismatic or Pentecostal pastor. And, and we have this ongoing thing where he sends me early every Sunday morning a little devotional. And then we're kind of in covenant to pray for each other Sunday morning before the service. And we just each do it on our own. So he sends me this devotional, and I, and I read it. And as I'm reading it, I'm, I'm like, I think I have a word for him. And I'll read the word I gave. It's a very simple, nothing profound. Now, it would make more sense if you read his devotional to me because it kind of plays off that. And what I want you to notice is I didn't say to this guy, I have a prophecy for you. <laughs> and neither did I say, thus saith the Lord. I'm not against that, but I, I didn't know if he would receive it that way. Um, so here's what I said. A word of encouragement for you today. I mean, is there anybody that doesn't believe a word of encouragement? You know, it's still a valid thing. So I said this, if you worship God and give your church family the opportunity and encouragement to worship God, in parentheses, to taste and see that the Lord is good, which was in his word, you will have been a success and had a successful service regardless of how the sermon goes. And then in parentheses, although I'm confident your sermon will rock. That was it. Here's what he sent back to me at 7.33 this morning. Oh, brother, that is such a good word, such all capitalized exclamation. Thank you, exclamation. I'm going to save this one. So a very simple word. I have no clue if he was struggling with this sermon that he's going to give this morning. I don't know if I'll hear anything else. Um, but anyway, I just thought that's the most recent example I have. All right, well, almost done. Different kinds of tongues, speaking forth a divinely inspired message in a language not learned by the one speaking the message. You've heard it on a Sunday morning here. Somebody comes up and speaks in a tongue, and I just want to make it clear, they don't know what they're saying. They haven't studied that language. They don't know that language, and unless God shows them, they don't know what the meaning of it was. So the message in tongue needs the last gift, the interpretation of tongues, which is interpreting by divine revelation a message in tongues. So then either that person or somebody else gives the meaning of it. Whoever's given the meaning of it, they don't know that language either. They're giving it by the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to point out that the gift is not translating the tongues. It's interpreting the tongues. There's a difference between interpreting and translating. Translating is like, you know, word for word. Interpreting is this is the, the gist of it. And, and I've often moved in in the gift of interpreting uh, tongues. But don't let, well, the, the, uh, I think the tongues was 45 seconds and the interpretation was a minute and a half. Something must be off here. Well, first of all, some languages take a lot more words to say the same thing, right? Plus, two people could interpret accurately and one be very succinct and one be like, you know, far more detailed, but both be basically the same word. So, uh, we will end there. Um, and by the way, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, the only two gifts we never saw, saw Jesus move in because the Holy Spirit hadn't been given yet. I want you to stand with me. And 
I want you to notice, again, that almost all of our examples we gave were not inside a church building. Think about that. And many of them were with lost people. So I just want to encourage you, God's gifted you. God has gifted you. The same Holy Spirit that, that was in Peter, Paul, Jesus, all, all, it's in you. The same Holy Spirit. And you're going to come across people this week that need something supernatural. A word of wisdom, a word of encouragement, uh, a, a, a word of something, or gifts of healing, whatever it might be. So just know that no matter how spiritual you feel you are or aren't, God can work through you if you're just open, if you're just willing. And what I want to do in closing is I just want to ask you right where you're standing just to say, here I am, Lord, use me, use me. Here I am, Lord, use me. I don't feel qualified, but I'm available. I'm available. If I can touch the life of someone else using one of these power tools, I want to do it. So let's just make ourselves available. As I close, prayer teams that are ministering today, make your way to the front. And uh, before you go, if you want prayer, we'll have some teams up here that'd be happy to pray with you. Uh, Father, I thank you that you've given us some power tools to extend your kingdom. And what amazing tools they are. And I thank you that they're by the Holy Spirit and that because all of us as children of Jesus have the Holy Spirit in us, I thank you that every one of these gifts is potentially in us to flow through us to touch someone else in any given situation. And your word tells us to desire the gifts. So we desire, God, to be used by you, not to lift ourselves up, not to try to impress someone else, but to touch the life of someone else, to draw others closer to you. So, Lord, I pray that there would be an impartation even now for a greater anointing to move in these gifts and to desire them more and ears to hear when we're in a situation that you want to speak through us or flow through us. And I'm even asking that every one of us this week, this week, every one of us would have an opportunity to touch someone else's life, even in a very simple way, maybe just one little phrase is all it takes to break through and to be a blessing. So I pray that you will give us that kind of faith and that uh, kind of an anointing. And I just pray that in the name of Jesus. As we go today, uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As you go today, know the power tools are in your toolbox. Get ready for God to use you in some unexpected ways, and we'd love to hear about how he uses you. You're welcome to go, but if you want prayer, again, feel free to come and get prayer before you leave today.